Okay, welcome to the last, one of the penultimate talk of Cyber Wizards. This one has got not so much to do with directly programming computers, but about set theory, which underpins a lot of modern mathematics, which also underpins computers, so there is possibly some relevance there. Um, this is a talk that I gave some time ago also at Studio Room, but I think that it has more relevance uh, going forward, so I will just give it now. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, it's called Prerequisite Free Set Theory, Just the Intuition. So I will attempt to give you just the intuition of what set theory is like. And as I move on to the next page, I will ask for, I once again, for a voiceover actor, and then set a time out to wait for five seconds, and then do it myself. Okay. Um, you want to do it? What do I have to do? Read some of the things on screen, and then have read and then play with the, with the banter that appears on screen. But you'd have to do it into this microphone. Things 
So the, 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 think about your, your intuition around what is the same about bunch or flock or heap. Um, but remember, none of this definition yet has included any numbers, and in fact, set theory won't. And I'll go back here. Uh, set, you say, I thought you were interested in numbers. In my research, I made use of the simple ideas of the priest of Balanza. I don't know if I go into the priest of Balanza again. I am, but sets are the basis of number. Oh? What is three but the set of all sets with three elements? Threeness is the common property of three umbrellas, or three horses, three hats, three cookies. Sets have most interesting properties. Really? And I thought them boring. So this is Russell talking about, this is Russell and some sort of friends I don't know, um, who in the 1920s started having ideas about, uh, or expanding on Cantor's ideas of sets. So it's nice to hear that, like, the idea of where three comes from comes from the notion of the magnitude of all sets that it's the size of all things that have three elements together. And so that's sort of how we define numbers. Um, if members of sets don't have to be numbers, what do members of sets have to be? Well, the two definitions we've got here, we've got two definitions from Cantor, and one was uh, distinguishable. So uh, we have to be able to say if two elements are the same. Um, that seems really weird because four definitely seems equal to four. But what is the thing that makes four equal to four? Um, it's that the size of four things is always the same size as another thing. It's, it's always a set that contains four things that always has the same number of things as another set that contains four things. Um, in the set of all feelings, so set can be anything, right? So what about the set of all feelings that occur to you on a Saturday? If I feel joyous two weeks in a row, is the way that I'm feeling this Saturday the same as last Saturday? Um, and that, so you may think about maybe if your joy, if your the emotion of joy to you is the same, is the joy of emotion to you the same if it occurs at different times? Well, maybe that's an, uh, that's an element of philosophy. Oh, that's an argument for philosophy. But the answer is not so important as us having a framework to answer it. So it's not like it's important that feelings are the same on both Saturdays. It's either that we have a way of determining that, yes, both were joyous feelings, or no, the joyous feelings occurred at different times, and both are valid answer, what I would call an answer system, to let us pick uh, one and only one of those answers. So it's just important that I have a way of determining sameness. And that's what we're going to need. So, that's, so distinguishability is the way, is, is the idea that we're going to be able to have like an equivalency operator, or be able to say if two things are the same. I mean, it sounds really weird. You've known the equal sign to be a pretty valid operation your whole life, or like a, a test your whole life. But my, the point here is that the equal sign is really necessary, and so now we're going down to like why we even need such a thing as like the equality operator. Uh, the other thing that elements of sets have to be is definite. Uh, so we have to be able to say definitely if a member is or is not a member of the set. So in the set of all feelings that occur on Saturday, is my hunger right now in the set? By the way, I gave this talk last time on Saturday, so it might, it might say Friday if I was wrong. Okay, in the set of all feelings that occur on Saturday, is the hunger right now in the set? So let's be sure that we can answer this question with a firm yes or no. Like, it must be, it, for any element of a set, it, it can't be a little bit true. Well, later on in Fuzzy Logic, this will become, you will, you will learn a distinction here. But for now, let us just say that, like, I, for anything, for any concept, and for any set, there has to be a yes, no determinate, like a procedure that says yes or no, something is or is out of the set. And it, so this is called a set membership test, and it should always give either a yes or a no, but it should never give both yes and no, and it should also never give neither yes nor no. So it would be really weird, well, well wouldn't it be weird if an element was both in a set and not in a set? And it would be really, 
the answer is to your intuition, it probably se would seem really weird. And so, in order for us to properly define sets, let's not allow that to happen and define it this way that the things can either be in or out, but not both, but not out and in, or not in and not out. Confusing? Okay. So members don't have to be explicit. So when we define a set, um, for example, ask to yourself the set of all horses. Okay. Is the set of all horses definite? Like, can I, for everything in the universe, would you be able to tell me if it's a horse or not a horse? Probably. And is it distinguishable? So, um, let's go back to our... Uh, we have to say it's two elements of the same. So, for every thing in the un for every horse in the universe, would you be able to tell me if a horse, if the, if you saw, if I like just gave you like an image of one horse, and then completely separately gave you an image of another horse, possibly the same horse, would you be able to tell me if that horse was the same, like if they were the same on the left or the right? Well, if I gave you the exact same picture and they were exactly identical, then you could probably say these are exactly the same. So, weirdly, that this seems like really, really basic, but in fact, I would say to say that the set of all horses is a valid set because it's both definite and distinguishable. But notice that I haven't said I haven't said the set of all horses contains horse A and horse B and horse C. It's just I've given the rules for what is in or out of the set, and what is in or out of the set is the things that are horses and not horses. So I haven't in this case I haven't explicitly defined what a horse is. I've just sort of implicitly given a definition of I've given a description of the set. And that's actually enough. Um, as long as long as my description contains both of these two properties being definite and distinguishable. Um, okay. I I give some answers here which I gave on the previous one about horses being definite and distinguishable. Okay. This is the key insight of set of, like def the definition of the set, is that the implication of definite and distinguishable is that a set is completely determined by its own <coughs> So that it means that all a set is, is its members, and it's nothing else. If I tell you what all the members of the set are, you know the complete description of the set. And likewise, if I give you the complete description of the set, you know what all the members are. So there's nothing, there's, not, there's, there's no magical third way or another way to describe a set besides just knowing what it's just just knowing what its members are or the description of the set. Okay, I will introduce you to set notation since you may see this somewhere. Uh, who's ever seen set notation before? Yeah, a few people. Okay, so I can go I'll go over this at medium speed. Uh, so this is by the way, this X is the reason that um, a program that you might have on your computer called LaTeX is written. I know this is not really a cross, but like two circles facing away from, half circles facing away from each other. That was so important to this computer scientist called Donald Knuth that, that this, it didn't look like a cross, but it looked like this, that there's a complete formatting language called LaTeX based on this. Some computer science history warm up for our computer science introduction later on. Okay, then we have an epsilon, which means membership, and then this is a set. So, this is defined as x is an element of x. And likewise, with the not equal sign, we have a not, ele not, not an element sign, which is an epsilon with a line through it. Or sort of an epsilon-like thing with a line through it. Uh, x is not an element of x. Um, okay, so another way to define a set is the explicit. So in this case, s is a set containing 1, 2, 3, and 14. And there are also uh, this notion of a predicate, and a predicate is going to be like a membership test. So the predicate definition is you supply the variable and the membership test. So this, this set, S is equal to the set, and you know it's a set for these curly braces. This is the variable that we're in question, X. Then you write this pipe P. So, um, so yes, this is like the pipe in Unix. Uh, well, I think that probably came from well, it's the same thing you type in your keyboard, but it's not exactly that way. Um, then, this, then we, 
that, so that uses a separator. Um, this is the test, is x even? And then you have the set of all numbers such that those numbers are even, or another way to say that is probably the set of all even numbers. Or you could have s is equal to all the horses, such that the horse has three legs. Um, and another way to say that is the set of three legged, the set of all three legged horses. Okay. Question time. See if you've understood it. Um, these are the examples. One. Is this list of numbers equal to this list of numbers? Okay, it's not. Is this set equal to this set? Why not? So, in fact, these sets are equal because part of the property of the set is that they're unordered. Because the set doesn't declare the ordering, and this is probably not something like that, like declared. So, but but the set doesn't declare an ordering. It's just a collection. The heap doesn't have any ordering to it. It doesn't really matter which what the order is. So as long as these things are just collections. So whether or not they're the collections of any element, the order of the collection is unimportant. So now I will give a slightly um, fanboyish way of talking about question about sets of all sets. So, or sets containing sets. So, my question, I have a three-way equality here. Is the set containing Morrissey and Bowie equal to the set containing the set which contains Morrissey and Bowie or equal to the set which contains two sets, the first of which contains one element which is Bowie and the second is one element which is Morrissey. Okay, so what are some of the differences there? For instance, the second set refers to a set itself, so you're referring to a set of sets. That's right, or yeah. A set of, say, artists. Yeah. Or a disperse. Right, yes. But wouldn't they be equal just because they contain all of the same elements? So it seems like these might actually be equal because the elements that are underlying each one are close to being are equal. But in fact, one of the ways that you can see why these are not equal is to look at the size of them. So the size of this set is two. The size of this set is one. And the size of this set is two. So this the, the reason that this set is not equal to this set, well, it certainly can't be true because their sizes are different. So in this case, this is just like me talking about two singers. And in this case, this is like me talking about the concept of two singers. And in this case, this is me talking about maybe the difference between the concept of what David Bowie and the concept of Morrissey. So they are slightly different just because, because when, once you put something in a set, it becomes different than just being the element itself, it's the set that contains the element. So, a little bit of a dis fine distinction there. Yeah. Is there always a superset? So, is there always a subset? Is there always a superset and always a subset? I'm glad you asked, and I will get to that in a second. Okay, I'm just going to read this here because I think that's funny, and then I will get to the answer to that question. So, the first one is like the set of Morrissey and Bowie, the duet. The next one is the set containing the duet, or like the concept of the duet, my fantasy, as I always claim. And the last is the set containing two sets, each of which containing a singer. <coughs> Maybe like the concept of their solo career. Uh, okay, isn't there always a superset and a subset? Well, there's always a subset, and it's called the empty set, and it's the only set that contains no elements, and it's written like this. And it looks like a it looks like a, a zero with a line through it, or maybe like the way that you might spell Soren if you were Norwegian or something like that. <laughs> um, this notion of the empty set is kind of important to think about a set that has no elements. And the thing is, like, well, how would you normally write it? Like, maybe you would write it like. Well, this this set looks like it's got nothing in it. 
but in fact, like, it's got this space in it, so like that's not good enough because it's like actually a thing that can exist. Well, to get around that, we just write we have this, like a special definition for it. Um, the weird thing about the empty set having no elements is that it's also when like was it odd to you when you were first learning about programming about the empty string, which is like or an empty list? Like this is where we get this com concept of the empty string or the empty list from is is directly from the empty set, which is about having a container that has no elements. Uh, so, it's a little bit difficult to grasp this notion at first, but a lot of emptiness, a lot of the idea of like the empty something will derive from this notion. So, my qu next question, back to you, Hugo, is the empty set equal to the set that contains the empty set? Yeah, well, it's, it's not. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I'm thinking of this in terms of like maybe not, not necessarily order of operations, but implementation of operations. And so when you get to the bottom of it, those sets all contain more suitability. And yeah. so I, I don't see why it's not true. Well, about this one. Okay, so what is this section? Yeah, I mean, it's not really important what their elements are. Um, it's just how many they are, there are of them, and if they are the same, and if they're distinguishable, and if they're definite. <coughs> so, next, the concept that you'll hear a lot is the set of all sets. So, we've seen that just like an element of an array can be an array, this comes from the notion that uh, a set can be an element of a set. But what about the set of all sets? Back to, I'd just be better if it was that we had really good voice actors now. For example, a set can contain other sets or even itself. How can it contain itself? Well, the set of all sets, the set of all, ide and all ideas is an idea, therefore it contains itself as an element. I agree, really have very low horizontal scrolling. Okay, but not all sets contain themselves. No, the set of all birds is not a bird smoking a pipe, which is good because it's going to have an aha moment. I say that's an interesting dichotomy. The set of all sets which contain themselves and the set of sets which don't. And then puffing along, and this is the this is the aha moment for um, Russell. So. Sometimes this is known as the barber paradox, which you will hear, but I think that that's kind of, I just, I'm going to recast it as the yoga teacher paradox, um, because it's not really important. A big math scandal, which temporarily destroyed set theory. Okay. Suppose there exists a village with just one yoga teacher, and everybody in that village, new next rule, okay, there's a rule one, there's a, a village with just one yoga teacher. Everybody in, next rule, everybody in the village does yoga. Rule three, every person in the village, for every person in the village, you, you learn yoga one of two ways. Everybody in the village either teaches themselves, or the other option is they are taught by the village yoga teacher. So, this is the question. Does the yoga teacher teach themselves? Any answers? Yeah. I guess it seems like the complicated the complication that's been thrown in is almost like the Z axis on an X and Y Cartesian plane. Because what you're adding is is really uh, time. You're adding the technology. Um, at what point is the chicken and egg really? Um, at what point could that egg uh, chicken have been born if not from an egg? 
interesting. So you're trying to, so in fact, what we have here is, is a paradox, and it's interesting that you try to solve, we, what, what's happening here is an actual a logical impossibility. And it's interesting that you're trying to solve it using time. And I think that what you've basically discovered what's wrong here, which is a chicken and an egg type scenario that's completely impossible. So it's a lot of a question. Yeah. Yeah, so what we have, what we have found is something that looks like a set but has such strange, weird, weirdo properties that it actually no longer is a set because it's both, well, we said that it can't both be in and out of the set or not be, so there's this one thing, let's just call it alpha, not being both in and out. And there's this other thing which you can't do, which is beta, which is like be not in and not out. And what we've done something is find something that satisfies, is not only just breaking alpha, but also breaking beta at the same time. It's just like destroy, it's like destroying all the definition all at once. So, so if you're still a little bit confused by this, then like, let's just, we'll just walk through it a little bit, because, and you might not even get it after this, and you might, it might take you a long walk home without listening, without any headphones, or maybe like a, a bath to finally get this, because I know that it did for me, and I always had to walk along, around a long time. But let's just go through the two ways that you can see this paradox. Okay, let's, there's point 3a. Everybody in the village teaches themselves. And there's point 3b. Every, they are taught by the village yoga teacher. So let's point that, suppose that point 3a holds. Then according to the rules, they are not taught as part, part of the villages that are taught by the yoga teacher. Okay, so the yoga teacher is not a villager that's taught by the yoga teacher. But since they are the yoga teacher, they are being taught by the yoga teacher. So 3A can't be true. So then we try the other way, right? So A can't be true, so B has to be true now. So let's see if B can be true. So suppose that the yoga teacher is taught by the village yoga teacher, okay? So then the yoga teacher is not part of the people that are taught by themselves. But since they are the yoga teacher, they are in fact teaching themselves. And so this supposition cannot be true. Okay, let's try another supposition. Oh wait, we don't have any more suppositions to try, so we run into a possible situation in which neither A or B can be true. So, this was the big scandal, which was like, we thought set theory was so cool, and then Russell was like, what about the sets of all sets that don't contain themselves? And then it was like paradox, and then I think a lot of pipe smoking ensued, or, but they were all pretty scared. So, just to let you know what happened, so this was the 1920s, almost maybe a hundred years ago. Set theory recovered from this problem of the creation of this thing known as classes, which um, is object-oriented programming. No, not quite. Um, they're different from sets, but I don't really want to talk about it, but then the thing that is a set of all sets that don't contain themselves is actually a class and not a set. And that's how they got around it, is they maybe moved around the definitions a little bit. Uh, but that's as far as I'm going to take this now. So that's a little bit of rigor uh, to try, it's just a minimal amount of rigor to get, to the, to get the concept of what a set should be. Um, but you can see now that it's like so fundamental that there's actually really like no math at all in it. And in, in fact, all numbers are built on set theory. Um, just like, we remember we at the very beginning talked about the successor function to define numbers, like in, our, in the uh, like register assembler language that we had earlier on there was only one a thing, it was like a plus one operation. So we are, the, the way that you define all the numbers using that assembly language is, you take the empty set, okay, this, what's the size of the empty set? It's zero. Okay, then what's the successor function applied to zero? Well, it's one. Okay, so now we can, what's the successor function applied to one? Two. So this is how we can generate all the numbers, this is how all the numbers are generated. Each number is generated as being the successor of the previous number, and that stops when you have the successor of the, what was the thing that gave the successor of one, which is zero, which is the empty set. So all numbers have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the size of a specific set. So giving us sets actually is what gives us numbers, because we just look at the size of different sets, and that's how we get a really like concrete and intuitive way of what a number is. Okay, homework. Wow, this is, I never realized this would happen. Your homework is the concept of an empty set in dinner time conversation, and I'm hosting dinner tonight, so that's funny. <laughs> okay.
Criatura. 